Well, as Chaplain Bill noted for us, so this is the week that we come together to celebrate expository preaching at Dallas Seminary. And it's always a great week, a special time when, when four of our students who are about to graduate have been selected to, uh, to speak to us. And uh, we're looking forward to it. And you might think, well, the, the pastoral ministries department is especially uh, involved in this. And we are. But it is a celebration for the entire faculty. So, because these are students who have been prepared through the, each of the divisions and each of their courses to get to this point where, uh, where the uh, long years of study can, uh, can uh, communicate the scriptures. So we're very thankful for this tradition and thankful that we get to celebrate. Now, here at Dallas Seminary, we we really put pretty high standards on what we mean by expository preaching. And uh, we expect people to be true to the text and clear for the mind and interesting to the ear and relevant for life. And uh, I believe that's what you're going to hear with each of the speakers uh, as, we, uh, as we enjoy them this week. Our first speaker is Mr. Sam Krug. Sam is from Chapman, Nebraska. And that was a Nebraska Cornhusker cheer right there. <laughs> He went to Grace. He didn't go to University of Nebraska. Maybe that's why. But uh, he's, he's completed his four years here. And I asked him, I asked Sam, what, what's the best thing about Dallas Seminary? What, what stands out in your mind in these four years of experience? I really thought he'd say, well, it was something I learned in the Division of Biblical Studies. Or it was a professor in the theological stu- Division of Theological Studies. Or he would say something about, you know, the, the, the preaching courses that he took. He said, without question. The prettiest girl at all of Dallas Seminary said yes when I asked her to marry me. We can't top that. That prettiest girl's named Lauren, and I think she's here. Lauren, where are you? Would you stand and let us acknowledge you? You made Dallas Seminary a better place for Sam. A little more seriously, I I did ask Sam what he enjoyed most about preaching. And he said there's something very powerful and satisfying about knowing how God has used you to help change the lives of somebody else through preaching. We understand that. Sam, it's great to have you. May the Lord bless you as you come and speak to us this morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am so excited and, and so honored to be here with, with each one of you today. Uh, I, I am excited to, to share what God has laid on my heart um, through, through his word and, and through the passage that we're going to talk about in just a couple minutes. Um, but before I, I jump in here, there's a couple people that, that I just have to thank first uh, before I jump in. And, and the first one, uh, I guess the first group of people, is, is the, really the pastoral ministries department. Uh, ve- way back when, my, my very first sermon here at DTS, Dr. Warren uh, assigned me, which I don't know where Dr. Warren is at. Okay, there he is, sitting in the back so he isn't embarrassed of me. Okay. Um, Dr., Dr. Warren assigned me uh, uh, a sermon to preach about the importance of the confession of sin. And so I decided I wanted to find this powerful story uh, of a pastor who decided that he was not going to confess his sin and, and who suffered the consequences of not confessing that sin. But to make it even more powerful, uh, I decided that I was going to foolishly tell the story in the first person. And, and so I stood up there and, and I said I had committed adultery and I had ruined my marriage and, and, and I had done all of these terrible things. And let me tell you, the class was engaged. They were engaged. <laughs> They got it. The, the only problem was I forgot to tell them that it wasn't actually me. <laughs> so in that, uh, in that moment, Dr. Warren and, and the rest of the PM department could have easily quit on me. And, uh, and I am so thankful that, that they didn't uh, and, and that I get to be here with you today. And, and I, I think the same thing could be said about every... Um, every other member of faculty here, that there have been so many opportunities that, that you all uh, could have quit on me, and, uh, and you didn't. Um, and so over the last four years, I, I, for the last four years, I am so thankful for each of you. Um, you've truly changed my life, and, and it has been a blessing 
Uh, and as uh, Dr. Anderson said, the person that I need to thank more than anybody else uh, is my sweet wife, who, who's over here. Lauren, I would, not, uh, I would not be up here if it wasn't for you. You really are the best thing for me about Dallas Seminary. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and I'm just so blessed by how you love me and how gracious you are to me. Eden back there is clapping, so we better give my wife another round of applause. <laughs> well, hey, let's, uh, now let's, let's dive, into, dive into the word. Um, many of you know, and, and as you can see by this rock that was placed up here, I have no idea who did that, uh, that, that I grew up uh, on a farm in the, in the great state of Nebraska. And while uh, the, the population of my hometown was 293 people, so there might be as many people in this room as were in my entire hometown, uh, which is funny in, in many, many ways. And so while I can't expect that any of you would, would know exactly what life is like growing up on a, a farm in rural Nebraska, I can't anticipate that you would realize that, that growing up on a farm requires a lot, a lot of work. And so while all my friends uh, got to go out and and go to the pool during their summers, and they got to play video games during their summers, I spent those long, hot summer days working on the farm with my dad and with my brother. And while I will admit to you that that was not uh, my favorite thing about the summer, there was one reason. There was one reason the summer was my favorite time of the year. And that one reason was that for one week out of the summer, I got to take a break from everything and I got to spend a week at camp. And as I look back at camp and, and I, I think about the, the things that meant most to me, why I loved it so much, the one thing that stands out is that every year at camp, my relationship with the Lord just went deep. It just went deep. And I will never forget one particular night as my counselor Toby was, was singing us to sleep with his guitar. And he sang the words of a song that I had never heard before. The, the words of a song that I would see would change my life. And Toby uh, sang the, basically the song that we're all familiar with, the text of Psalm 84, which, which goes, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. And as I, as I listened to those words, my life was changed. Because I realized that everything that Toby was saying was true. That there was nothing in the entire vastness of the universe than truly knowing deeply and intimately the God who created it. And that absolutely revolutionized my life. And and it turned into a season of sweetness where I woke up every morning just excited uh, to spend time with the Lord. Excited to commune with my Savior and, and to be with Him. I imagine as each of you think back on, on your faith journey and where God has you at, that, at this point, you can see seasons uh, of those mountaintop experiences when you felt like you could just reach out and touch God. And your, your desire to meet and be with him superseded your desire for anything else, for anything else. But friends, I, I fear that for many of us here at the seminary, those seasons of of sweetness and communing with the Lord grow further and farther between. I know that in many ways that that has been the case in my life as I have made myself so busy trying to learn more information about God that, that I have been so tempted and so often have neglected the opportunity that I have to truly know God. And as a result of that, I, 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 there's been many seasons for me here at seminary that I have been burned out, that I have been anxious, that I have been tired, and that I just wanted everything to be over. I imagine for many of you as we get into these final uh, two weeks of, of the semester here, uh, that many of you are feeling exactly the same way. You're tired, you're burned out, and you're ready for this, this semester to be over. And if that's the case for you, I really hope that I can encourage you today as we talk about how to fill your weary spirit, how, how to give life to your dry bones, and how to have that intimacy with God that, that we have all at camp, not just for one week out of the year, but for all 52 weeks. The passage that we're going to be looking at today is, is Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. If you have your Bibles, um, you, can, you can turn with me there. Again, it's Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. 
As we study this, we're going we're to just look at three things. All right, we're going to see what happens when we make our work our highest priority. We're going to see what happens when we make our worship our highest priority. And then we're going to finish by talking about how we, can, how we can fill our weary spirits. Okay? So again, what happens when we make work our highest priority? What happens when we make worship our highest priority? And how we can, can choose to fill our weary spirits? Um, that'll be the third point. As you are looking at the, the text in front of you, I'm sure that you can see in the subheading that we are going to be talking about a very familiar story today. We're going to be talking about Mary, and we're going to be talking about Martha, a story that you have probably heard 10,000 times before. Uh, but I want to encourage you today, as we read this passage, that you look at it with a fresh set of eyes, as if you have never uh, read this story before, because I think that there are many things deeper here than, than just um, our apparent at the surface. Uh, so again, the first point that I want to make this morning as we dive into this text is that prioritizing our work over our worship leads to anxious living. Prioritizing work over worship leads to anxious living. Verse 38. Now as they were traveling along, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. If you're reading this for the first time, you would have thought, just stopping at verse 38, that Martha, Martha was the one that was going to be celebrated in this passage. Because if you look with me in, in verses 30 through 37, the immediate paragraph before we see the story of the Good Samaritan. And it's the purpose of the story of the Good Samaritan is that we are called to, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are called to go out of our way to work. And then you see this story, this verse with Martha, and she went out to welcome Jesus into her home. The same word that the Greek word uses for welcomed him into her home is the same word that's used of Zacchaeus and Luke just a couple of chapters later to show that what Martha was doing is something that is good. Her work was not the problem. And Luke's trying to reveal that to us theologically. She's doing something good, but, but the problem comes with something at the core of her heart. Let's keep reading to figure out what that might have been. Verse 39 says, uh, She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. And again, if you see this, this story uh, of the Good Samaritan, and, and then you see the story of Martha, the first thing that you're going to think when you see what Mary was doing was lazy Mary. Lazy Mary. Why is Mary sitting around doing nothing when her sister is doing all the work? And I think if you, you think in those terms, you think that Martha is incredibly justified with the question that she asks in verse 40. She says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then ask, then tell her to help me. Tell her to help me. Martha was upset. And, and we can see with, with the intensity of this language that she had absolutely no question that Jesus was going to rebuke Mary and that Jesus was going to honor Martha. But instead, what we see in Jesus' response a couple verses later was that Martha had a case of misplaced priorities and that Martha was valuing her work above her worship. Friends, I, I fear that we have a case of misplaced priorities today. And if I'm honest, I fear that we have a case of, of misplaced priorities here at Dallas Seminary. And the reason that, that I share these, these things with you is that in life, you are going to serve as one of two things. You are going to serve as a wonderful example, or you are going to serve as a horrible warning. I want you to hear that. Your life is going to serve as a wonderful example, or your life is going to serve as a horrible warning. And if you place your work above your worship, I can guarantee you which one of those two things is going to be true of your life. I don't want that for any one of you, and I certainly do not want that for myself. And I'm so thankful that the text doesn't leave us there. It gives us an opportunity to choose something different. So as we, we look at these next two verses and, and we get to the second point this morning, I want to say that prioritizing worship, prioritizing worship over work leads to life and peace. 
Prioritizing worship over work leads to life and peace. Read with me. Uh, I guess in, the, in these verses, you're going to see that Jesus very different priorities. Um, read verse 41 and 42 with me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. One thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. As we look at this, I want you to, to first see what the result of Martha's working was, and it yielded anxiousness. Yielded anxiousness. And also, I want you to see what the result of Mary's uh, worship was, and that was she received something that would not be taken away from her. Friends, I want, I want to suggest that very clearly this passage is saying is that the one thing that will never be taken away is our worship. It will never be taken away. But, but what, is that, what does that really mean? It won't be ta- our worship won't be taken away. What this is saying is that our relationship, our intimacy with Jesus Christ cannot be taken away by anyone and by anything. And what Jesus is also saying when he says that that, that will not be taken away is that many other, many other things in our lives will be taken away. And so I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news uh, for many of you today because I know that you're working so hard to finish up your assignments, uh, maintain that holy GPA that you've been working for, for for the last four years. But I want to let you in on a little bit of a secret, okay? As someone who's getting ready to graduate, has sent my resume out to many places, nobody cares about your GPA, okay? <laughs> nobody, hear that very clearly, nobody cares about your GPA. Didn't I have one church ask me for my GPA? And if anything, that is, that is a testimony to these people here. Because when people see Dallas Theological Seminary, they know that you received a tremendous education. Because these people have sacrificially, the faculty has sacrificially served uh, to give you that tremendous education. So when they see Dallas Seminary, they don't care what your grades are. They cared what you learned, and you learned from these people. But yet the problem still remains when we value our, our work over our worship, we are missing something. I know that there's a, a prevalent theme at, at DTS, and we talk about it a lot, that every assignment that we do and every test that we take should be done as an act of worship. And I completely agree with that. I agree with, with every part of that. But I think we have to tread extremely carefully here. Because our seminary education is intended to be a supplement for our relationship with God. It is never intended to be a substitute for our relationship with God. Okay, so hear me again when I say this. Our seminary education is not a substitute for our relationship with God. Our seminary education is a supplement to our relationship with God. And if the only time you are getting in God's word, communing with the Lord, is through your classes, then I, I fear that you have a case of misplaced priorities as well. A few of you know uh, that in September, my, my sweet wife is going to be having a, having a baby. And uh, when I, thank you, that's right. When I, uh, when I heard that for the first time, I have to confess that I was in absolute shock. Uh, I could not believe that that was coming. Uh, but when we went to the doctor and we had our first sonogram and I saw this picture, everything changed for me. Everything changed for me. Because while to you this might look like some pixelated blob of black and white, uh, a black and white picture, to me this is my, this is my flesh and blood. This is, this is my son. This is my child. And I cannot wait to meet this little guy. Uh, When he comes, I am going to hold him. I am going to love him. I'm going to kiss him. I'm going to be making all those weird baby sounds. (laughs) But it it doesn't even matter because I'm going to care about my son. And I know that in September, there is a potential for many other things to distract my time, uh, to take me away from from my son. But I can guarantee you right now that there is nothing that is going to be more important to me than getting to know that little boy. 
friends, do you, do you realize that the desire that I have to get to know my son is nothing compared to the desire that God has to know you? It is nothing compared to the desire God has to know you. I want to encourage you today, do not sacrifice the great on the idol, on, on the altar of the good. Don't sacrifice your relationship with the Lord for the opportunity to, to learn more about him without truly, truly knowing him. We have an opportunity every single day to, to truly get to know the God of the universe. And that is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, if you're anything like me uh, yet, even though we realize all of these things, it is still hard to prioritize, prioritize time every day to spend with the Lord. And so we, as we move into uh, this last point this morning, I want to talk about how we can fill our weary souls, how we can choose well every single day to value our worship over our work. Because let's face it, each one of us is either going to be a Mary or we're going to be a Martha. We're going to be, we're going to be one or the other in, in, in many ways. And so you, and if we're honest, seminary tends to breed Martha's. We work really, really hard here. And that is not a bad thing. That is a good thing. That is a blessing. But if we work so hard that we push out our time with God, then, then we have missed it. We have completely missed it. And so in order to, to choose well today, I think we would, we would do best to take a page from, from Mary's playbook uh, and look back at verse 39. As we read this, you're going to see that Mary did two things to prioritize her time with the Lord. Uh, the text says, Mary was seated at the Lord's feet, and Mary listened to his word. Two things. It's not complicated. She was seated at the Lord's feet, and she listened to his word. Well, what does it mean that Mary was seated at the Lord's feet for us? For Mary, that means that even though she had 10,000 things to do, there was a host of people in her house. She had work to do, but she stopped. She stopped everything that she had to do. She cleared her mind from every distraction and she spent time with the Lord. The second thing that we see is, is that Mary listened to the Lord's words. She didn't just hear them. They didn't just come into her head, but she listened clearly to the Lord's words. I think uh, one problem that we can have at seminary is that we acquire a tremendous amount of information. And the problem with people that acquire a tremendous amount of information is that they can become really bad listeners because we feel like we, we, feel like we already know everything. And if we already know everything, what's the point of, of, of sitting down and listening? So let me ask you, when was the last time you sat down and listen to God's words. I'm not asking you when the last time was when you read the Bible or the last time that you prayed, but when was the last time that you cleared all of your to-do lists out of your head? You eliminated every distraction that you have and you listened to what the Lord had to say to you. Not what the Lord was, was gonna say to all the other people that you're gonna minister to, okay? But what the Lord had to say to you personally. Friends, if this daily time of God, this daily separating ourselves and listening to God's words is not something that we have a consistent habit of doing, then we are missing out on our relationship with the Lord. And that is not something that I want any of you, and that is not something that I want myself to miss out on. As I, as I said and have alluded to Several times through this sermon, uh, I began this semester tired, and I began it burnt out, and I began this semester just wanting everything to be over. I just wanted to be done, I wanted to be out of here. But as I sat on my couch one night a couple months ago, I, I realized that that's not how I wanted to leave. I realized that I, if I left Dallas Seminary with anything, I wanted to leave Dallas Seminary with a closer relationship to the Lord than I have ever had. And so I took, I, I decided that I was going to spend an hour with God sitting and listening to his words every single day. And I can tell you that this has been the busiest season of my life. Satan has thrown many, many things at me to try to distract me from spending time with the Lord. 
But I can tell you that because I have made that a priority, I am at more peace than I have ever been in my entire life. <clears throat> John Piper has, has a wonderful quote. Um, and it really challenged me as I was thinking about these things. He said that you can read theology for 10 hours a day for 40 years and not know God as beautiful and all satisfying as the highest treasure of your life. Who cares about knowing God the way the devil knows God? He hates everybody. If we are here and we are just getting to know more information about God without truly knowing God, we have completely missed the whole point of being at Dallas Seminary. But I, I want to encourage you today that no matter what you have done in the past, today you have a new opportunity to choose well. You have a new opportunity to place the priority of worship above your work. And I want to encourage you uh, to take that opportunity today. Do not miss another day, the opportunity to commune with the Lord. I want to close by um, reading one quote uh, from a book called Subversive Spirituality by Eugene Peterson. I think he shed some incredible wisdom on this subject. He says, I want you to simplify your lives. When others are telling you to read more, I want to tell you to read less. When others are telling you to do more, I want to tell you to do less. The world does not need more of you. It needs more of God. Your friends do not need more of you. They need more of God. And you do not need more of you. You need more of God. Friends, today here at this school, we have a chance to have more of God. The only question is whether you are going to take that opportunity and you are going to choose well. I pray that each one of us does. Lord, I thank you so much um, for the fact that you love us and you desire a relationship with us and the fact that you never fail to be there when we seek you. Lord, we are so humbled by your love for us. And we came to this place because we wanted to know you more. I pray that you would help us not to value all the things that we do over our relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make that the highest priority of our life, uh, for that is the greatest gift that we could possibly have. We love you, Lord, and, and we thank you for the relationship you desire to have with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.